You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 12, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, pathogenesis of asthma. Our presenter is Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser. He's an emeritus professor and past president of the World Allergy Organization. This is uh, COLA for Monday, August 12, 2019. Um, we have two lectures this morning. Um, the first is by Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser. Um, he's going to speak on human asthma pathogenesis. Um, Dr. Rosenwasser is a former faculty member of ours here at Children's Mercy. He's also well known in the allergy community as an expert um, on asthma and eosinophilia. Um, he's the past president of the Academy of Allergy and also the past president of the World Allergy Organization, and we're very pleased that he had time to speak with us today. So we'll let Lanny take it away. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Looks like we're finally rolling. So um, my introductory slide's already done. Let's go to the next one. It's just a cartoon um, making light of my uh, conflicts. Next slide is my actual conflicts. They do play a role because... Uh, I do uh, talk about some of the biologics made by some of these uh, companies that I'm consultant for. My main consul consultancy at this point is for Regeneron and Sanofi. I've been on the IDMC for Dupilumab since 2009 when it was first tried, uh, now through a number of successful uh, approvals. So um, that's really my major conflict. I will talk about Dupilumab and a variety of other um, biologics made by AZ and Teva, who I've also consulted for. I'm on the protocol review committee for the NHLBI PRECISE uh, program and had been on the ASMANET uh, PRC when ASMANET was up and running. So that is my link to NIH. Okay, enough of my conflicts, if such as they are. Okay, move to the next we can. Hold on. For some reason, I'm not able to. Hmm. Okay. This is just um, learning objectives. I don't know why they turned out to be so little when I when I uploaded this, but uh, the, <laughs> the, the font for that is very low. But um, most of what we'll talk about involves pathogenesis. And uh, we live in a very interesting time for pathogenesis of disease in terms of allergic disease because we know quite a bit about some of the cytokine families activated through innate and adaptive immunity that leads to um, asthma and other allergic diseases. And uh, we are beginning to actually dissect the role of some of the cytokine and cytokine families in this whole process because we have agents that inhibit the various cytokines, and some of which have made a significant influence on uh, practice of uh, of asthma treatment. So let's move on to the next one. Asthma is defined uh, at least now for 30 years by the four following uh, criteria. They're narrowing of the airways, airway obstruction, airway inflammation, and increased airway responsiveness. Um, the big leap forward uh, 30 years ago was the recognition that asthma is not just twitchy lungs that close the breathing tubes, but it's actually inflammation and immunity within the, within the airway that leads to uh, inf uh, obstruction and hyper-responsiveness. And the immunohistopathology was able to be deciphered starting in the 1930s, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 1980s, not the 1930s. If it was the 1930s, maybe we'd have a cure by now. But in the 1980s, uh, it was clear uh, through the ability to sample the airway through bronchoscopy that the pathology of asthma could be delineated. And there's clear denudation of airway epithelium, collagen deposition, edema, inflammatory cell activation and accumulation uh, in the uh, airway wall that leads to the obstruction and the hyper-responsiveness characteristic of asthma. Asthma is a disease that could be intermittent in its uh, activation uh, so that you can have symptoms uh, very, very frequently uh, 
relieved by the various kinds of interventions we'll talk about, but the underlying pathology is still there, the underlying inflammation is there, and the recognition of that led to the idea that long-term uh, control or treatments were required to control the disease. Next slide. Uh, just shows the inflammation one sees. Uh, up over here, you can see that there's uh, disrupted airway epithelium, uh, submucosal uh, inflammation, and thickening of the basement membrane below the uh, epithelium, uh, characteristics of the pathology of asthma. Next slide. Just shows the dense eosinophilia that's seen in the majority of cases of asthma, probably up to 80% of asthmatic cases will have uh, eosinophilia associated with the asthma in the airway wall, if not in other areas, but at least uh, clearly in the airway wall, and in the sputum as well, if you can collect it adequately and analyze it. Next slide. Uh, just shows a more high power view of uh, scanning EM of epithelium that's normal on the left and asthmatic on the right where the epithelium is destroyed and denuded and the uh, submucosa uh, and basement membrane gets directly exposed to the airway. Next one, please. There's um, this airway remodeling that we're talking about with the inflammation and immunity in the airway wall is associated with airway wall thickening, subepithelial fibrosis, increased myocyte mass and myofibroblast hyperplasia as part of this remodeling process, and mucous metaplasia and enhanced mucus uh, gland uh, numbers and, and secretion. So mucus uh, is an increased amount. There's actually physiologic consequences of this airway thickening and long-term airway remodeling. Um, there's in some cases, irreversible or partially reversible airway obstruction. So the definition of asthma involves reversibility of airway responsiveness. If there is irreversible or only partially reversible airway obstruction, it could be due to permanent changes induced by the remodeling. Or it may be an overlap with other diseases in middle-aged asthmatics who have had on and off control for 20 years. Um, they develop a phase that's very hard to determine the difference between COPD and asthma. And so there's this um, asthma COPD overlap syndrome, ACOS, that's been described. It's hard to know if it's really a part of COPD or if it's really the end, end effect of the uh, irreversible, partially reversible airway obstruction one sees with airway remodeling. Nonetheless, um, that's something that's a fact of life. If you have asthmatics who are reaching their fifth, sixth, seventh decade, um, the partially reversible airway obstruction has to be put in light with possible susceptibility for COPD and, and long-term asthma findings. Airway hyperresponsiveness is characteristic of the physiology of airway remodeling. There's never been a situation where airway hyperresponsiveness has been demonstrated without some of the changes associated with remodeling in the airway wall. Um, and there are a lot of um, there are a lot of explanations about uh, airway hyperresponsiveness that have been put forward, but none of them have really been fully and completely identified in terms of mediators. So airway hyperresponsiveness has been talked about as a neurovascular response or a reflex response potentially to airway inflammation, but um, the actual mediators of that kind of pathway haven't been identified. And in addition, um, the uh, um, uh, there are there's some data to suggest that just constricting the ability of the lung to expand and limiting uh, airway uh, function in that way, independent of inflammation, may lead to hyperresponsiveness. So this re remains sort of one of the dark holes in asthma research uh, that needs to be identified. There's a greater decline in FEV1 uh, in asthmatics as opposed to controls. Normal people, when they reach the age of about 20, have the zenith of their FEV1 function in terms of lung function. And everybody, even normals, non-asthmatic, non-smokers, fall off with an FEV1 of 22 ml per year. An asthmatic who doesn't smoke and doesn't get exposed to any other kind of airway or lung toxins <clears throat> falls off at 38 mLs per year. 
So identifying what it is in remodeling that leads to these physiologic changes may be an important factor in trying to understand the actual aging in the lung as well. So uh, the physiology is very important. About 10 or 15 years ago, the view of asthma was that it was an adaptive immune response to something, virus, bacteria, or pollen or an allergen that leads to the T cells being uh, recruited in a specific manner uh, that then uh, alters the airway epithelium and leads to remodeling. Uh, this uh, very nice model has uh, now been fully um, redone and re reevaluated. Next slide, please with a, a different view of how it works, namely that the viruses, allergens, toxins, particulates impinge on the epithelium, cause changes in the epithelium that are semi-permanent, including epigenetic changes potentially in the epithelium that makes us susceptible to further exacerbations on re-encountering these same kind of uh, insults. The epithelium in response to the insults make a series of um, uh, 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 agents that are uh, thought to be um, uh, response to, di to danger and to, to toxicity and infection. And the uh, three that are of importance for the development of allergic responses in the airway with epithelium, but also in the GI tract and in the skin and in other areas include production of TSLP and IL-33 and to some degree IL-25, although I think that works further down the the pathway. But these three uh, alarmins, as they're called, or cytokines that are uh, generated when the epithelium is uh, triggered or injured, uh, can alter uh, the function of a variety of immune responses. So the favored T cells that were adaptive immune responses responding to allergens that were at the center of pathogenesis now are off in the left lower corner along with a bunch of other different cells that are of importance in terms of the inflammation and immunity in the airway and in the other tissues that have an allergic response leads to downstream responses that include the uh, production of um, mediators like lipid mediators, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, other cytokines including TGF-beta, IL-17, and enzymes such as tryptase and, and other kinds of and caspase, for example, that are pro-inflammatory that lead to even more inflammation and remodeling downstream. So no longer is the adaptive immune response at the center of this, but rather the innate immune response and the ability of the epithelium to activate uh, these agents, uh, these cytokines listed here, and other agents that might affect toll-like receptors and other kinds of cellular activating signals um, that lead to a type 2 immune response. Next slide, please. Um, it just shows in this slide, um, this is from immunodeficiency, but the same ideas are there. So toll-like receptors and IL-1 receptors lead to activation of IRAC and MIT-88, whereas T-cell receptors, cytokine receptors, uh, generally activate uh, uh, JAK kinases that uh, affect I kappa K. This is becoming more important again, more important as we start to develop specific inhibitors of things like Mighty88 and um, Jack kinases, which have become available for treating inflammatory diseases, and will be tried, I think, in asthma and other allergic diseases, in place of some of the biologics we'll talk about. So the next wave will be kinase inhibitors that get to those materials. Next slide. Um, one of the points to bring up about the T cell responses is that the so-called Th2 cells that were thought to be so important are just one of many different cells that can make the cytokines like IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13 characteristic of a type 2 immune response. And the milieu, a high IL-4, the ability to generate GATA-3 and STAT-6 leads to that proclivity. Whereas having other cytokines such as IL-12 or interferon generating TBET and STAT4 leads to the interferon producing Th1 cells. Or TGF-beta and IL-6 leads to the Th17 cells, which may or may not play a role, especially in neutrophilic asthma. And TGF-beta and IL-2, utilizing FOXP3 predominantly in STAT5, generate regulatory T cells, 
that can downregulate some of the effects of the specific T cells. What's become clear in the next in the last 10 years, next slide, is that none of these cytokine responses, oh, before we get to that, let's just point out that the regulatory T cells are specific for the adaptive Th1 and Th2 T cells and can regulate their expression. Usually through the expression of TGF-beta and IL-10, they are suppressive to other T cells. They use FOXP3 and a unique growth factor called interleukin-35. So that's worth keeping in mind. The regulatory T cells are positive for CD4 and CD25. CD25 is the IL-2 receptor, so I, regulatory T cells are utilized not just IL-35, but also IL-2 for their activation. Next slide. Um, there are many other subsets of cells that have been identified in the response in the airway. Natural killer cells, innate natural killer cells, each of which have unique cell surface receptors and cytokine programs, gamma delta T cells, Th22 T cells, which are important predominantly in the um, uh, skin diseases like atopic dermatitis and even psoriasis, and the Th9 C T cells that are part of an allergic response, and more uh, recently the T follicular helper cells that are uh, uh, especially important in producing responses that um, potentiate type 2 immune responses and are therefore important in allergic responses. About the last 10 years or so, 7 to 10 years, has been the identification of a group of cells that for all the world look like these T cells that have been identified that require different cytokines and transcription factors to be active, but they don't have any of the markers of T cells or T cell development, and they're bone marrow derived and or mesenchymally derived as opposed to, um, as opposed to uh, being thymically dependent. And these innate lymphoid cells produce an ILC group 1 TH1 cytokines. Most important for allergic disease, ILC group 2 TH2 cytokines. And the ILC group 2, ILC2 cells are very, very sensitive to the stimulatory effects of TSLP and IL-33. And that's thought to be the way in which um, uh, some of the uh, innate immune responses activated at the epithelial membrane um, generate uh, an allergic-like uh, profile uh, in some of the pathology. ILC group 3 look like IL-17 type cells uh, and are in the skin as well as in the airway and other tissues, uh, GI tract, etc. Okay, next slide. Asthma is very complex, so this pathogenesis we've started on uh, has several orders of magnitude of complexity. And you can think of it starting at the microbiome, the actual microbes within the airway that uh, may influence response, uh, proteome, transcriptome, and genome of the epithelium and the underlying uh, immune inflammatory cell panoply that's involved in asthma. And then you have to have tissue, organ, whole body responses, and even brain responses, since we know emotion can have a big effect on some of the breathing complexities of asthma. So there's a, a variety of these processes. And when you see these little diagrams that I show you about the receptors and the cells and which cells are doing what, all of that is occurring in three dimensions. What I'm showing you on a cartoon is in two dimensions, but the receptors, the ligands, all take place and interact in a three-dimensional way. And over time, so there's a fourth dimension. So asthma is highly complex. So it's not surprising. This um, next slide is a depiction of the, uh, the last EPR3 now, I guess, 11 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, the last NHLBI attempt to try to make a stepwise approach for managing asthma. You can see how complex it was 12 years ago. It's just as complex complex now, but NHLBI doesn't devote any money to upgrading this, so this is what we're left with. GINA, the Global Initiative in Asthma, um, generally updates their approach, uh, schematic approach, about every year, year and a half. So we'll talk a little bit about some stuff that they generated in the last year, uh, if we have time by the end of the talk. Next slide. So for severe asthma, the definition of this came up about five years ago in an ATS-ERS task force uh, 
in which severe asthma was defined by those individuals who need high-dose inhaled steroids and a second controller, either a long-acting beta agonist or a leukotriene receptor antagonist for a year with no improvement in terms of their functional symptoms and or, uh, or other measurement of asthma activity or use of systemic steroids for 50% of the year. So if they're on oral steroids for 50% of the, to of the year, for if they have enough exacerbations, three or four, that they're really on steroids for six months out of the year, uncontrolled uh, despite this therapy is the definition of uh, severe asthma. Next slide. And the assessment of control is an ACQ less than 1.5 an ACT greater than 20, utilizing NAEP or GINA guidelines for definition of ACQ and ACT. Frequent exacerbations, serious exacerbations, some of which may require intubation and assisted ventilation. And airflow limitation, with no percentages or no cutoffs, but any evidence of airflow limitation was, I think, correctly included in the definition of severe asthma. Now, for 20 years, the long-term controller medications are still the same. They're inhaled corticosteroids or leukotriene modifiers or long-acting beta agonists or, in some circumstances more recently, long-acting anticholinergics in those individuals who don't get bronchodilatation with a long-acting beta agonist uh, are utilized. For quick relief, short-acting beta agonists are utilized although their value has been called into question based on some more recent studies utilizing uh, some of the quick-acting, long-acting beta agonists in conjunction with inhaled steroids um, that go back to um, dosing suggested by the SMART study now 15 years ago. Um, and uh, anticholinergics can be used for an acute bronchodilatation and uh, a bolus of systemic corticosteroids obviously is something that could be utilized for quick relief, uh, not over a day, or not over a few minutes, but over a day or something of that sort. The agents for severe asthma have included in the past 12 years, omalizumab is probably the first choice, but there have been multiple studies utilizing methotrexate, macrolides, antifungal agents, um, a, uh, a surgical procedure, a lung surgical procedure called bronchial thermoplasty, that no one knows exactly how it, how it works in some of the severe asthmatics, but there are some asthmatics who respond well to bronchial thermoplasty, and they have to be uh, adequately selected based on their physiology and findings. Muscarinic antagonists, uh, the more uh, long-acting uh, um, agents uh, that are anticholinergics are utilized there. And the thing that has been of greatest interest probably in the last, ever since omalizumab came on, was actually using anti-cytokines as a potential treatment uh, for severe asthma. Omalizumab has great efficacy in asthma, uh, some efficacy in rhin rhinitis, rhinosinusitis, and greatest efficacy on a, on a percentage basis with uh, chronic um, uh, uh, idiopathic urticaria. Uh, it has a bunch of characteristics listed there in terms of what it does, but it clearly is anti-inflammatory. Uh, it doesn't work by blocking allergen reactivity per se, but it blocks by um, cutting down on the amount of IgE, which subsequently causes a reduction in receptors on um, basophils and mast cells, which are the primary targets for some of the IgE-mediated immune responses and um, may play a role in asthma, as well as urticaria and, uh, and, and uh, rhinosinusitis. So um, emerging biotherapeutics are aimed at a variety of other cytokine families. I'll talk about IL-1 because it's of interest to me, but uh, the IL-5 family, IL-17, and IL-13, and most importantly, the combination of an anti-IL-4 receptor alpha that blocks both IL-4 and IL-13. These are the names of the, and not the trade names, but the actual um, gener the, the generic names of the agents that have been utilized. Uh, Pitrokinra and Pascalizumab, neither of these will ever be approved because they work on IL-4 alone. Uh, and their role has probably got some weak positivity, but we don't really know. Mepolizumab, Reslizumab, Benrolizumab are the three agents that block IL-5. 
MEPO and ResLiz directly by binding IL-5, Benrau by blocking the IL-5 receptor alpha, but um, they're relatively indistinguishable in terms of how well they do in eosinophilic asthma, and they do quite well. One or two of them, I think Mepolizumab and probably Benrau, uh, Mepo has been approved for eGPA, and Benrau has got uh, an application for eGPA. I don't know about reslizumab and eGPA, but I, I don't, but there have been other eosinophilic diseases that these agents have been utilized for with some effect. Anti-IL-13 looked very, very uh, promising initially, but none of these are really on track to be utilized in asthma, partially because anti-IL-4 and anti-IL-13 dupilumab, which beat out AMG-317 as the best in this class of agent, has been approved over the past two and a half years for a number of indications, which we'll talk about in a moment. Anti-TSLP, also known as uh, tezolizumab, uh, AMG-157 is on, on tap in phase three trials now to be utilized in asthma, as is anti-IL-33, which is a uh, uh, anti-REGN-3500. doesn't have a name yet, but it will have one soon. IL-5 plays a major role in asthma, it's summarized in this cartoon, um, and the airway injury by the materials that eosinophils make is well known. Uh, their ability to get into the uh, airway utilizing, um, utilizing uh, adhesion molecules and vascular interactions through the vascular transmigration process are known. Granule proteins and, and other kinds of materials, leukotrienes, are made that have airway injury potential. So IL-5 is a major player in asthma. Next slides, next two slides, I think. This one shows some of the earliest studies identifying steroid sparing effects with mepolizumab. Uh, next slide, just the same same study with anti-IL-5 in human asthma from two different groups, one in Canada, one in the UK, but since replicated all over the world and with an approval of uh, mepolizumab for asthma now about two and a half years ago. Next slide. Uh, same, more or less exact same data was accomplished with reslizumab. Reslizumab is uh, approved. There are some subtle differences. Mepolizumab is uh, generally given by injection. Reslizumab can be titrated to the size of the patient because it's given via intravenous infusion. And so some people think that in the more severe issues, perhaps reslizumab would have a greater advantage, but you have to have access to infusion uh, to actually give reslizumab. So that may be a little bit of a difficult issue. Dupilumab has had um, studies in up to eight or 9,000 subjects with atopic dermatitis and asthma worldwide. These are a couple of the studies, uh, most, all of them in New England Journal or Lancet, that identify uh, uh, benefits of uh, dupilumab in these agents. I had a cartoon that identified where dupilumab works by blocking the site on IL-4 receptor alpha that binds both IL-4 and IL-13, and there's both complete inhibition of those two activities through cytokines in, um, with dupilumab treatment. So it's a very uh, interesting way. Ne next slide is where I had that other picture, so I'll send the new presentation to Paul, and if you want to look at that picture, you can see it. The picture comes from Sanofi, so it's... Uh, I'll make the I'll make the um, disclosure now, but it's got a cartoon that identifies the different receptors for both IL-4 and IL-13, and how the combined receptor, the heterodimer, is the important one for a lot of the biology. TSLP is a thymic stromal lymphopoietin. It's an epithelial cytokine that's in the IL-7 family, but it's not IL-7 itself. Its receptor is also in the IL-7 receptor family. It activates cells of innate immunity. The ones are listed there, including ILC, ILC2. And it skews TH2 expression. Its expression correlates with asthma and asthma severity. And genetic variants have been associated with atopy, asthma, uh, air, um, airway hyperresponsiveness, all the things that you would expect from a type 2 disease. Blocking it blocks a late phase response, which is what now has become the 
the best uh, measure of whether or not you should go forward with an agent uh, that's anti-cytokine in terms of its ability to help in asthma blocking the late phase. If it doesn't do that, then it's probably not going to work in asthma. And it did for TSLP, now published a number of years ago. Next slide. T the uh, tezapelumab, this one that, you know, um, the last two slides were on, this one here, is in phase three. So I think within a year or two, it'll probably be close to being approved. Um, of greatest interest would be whether or not tezapelumab or the RG, REGN 3500 anti-IL-33, if either of them add something to what dupilumab does or what the anti-IL-5 agents do, uh, that'll be of great interest. Um, you can speculate about all of that, but until data comes out to look at the relative potency of these agents, tezapelumab or REGN 3500, uh, we won't really know which of those, if any, uh, potentially could replace the anti-IL-5 or the dupilumab uh, type diseases. Next slide. IL-1 is important in allergy and asthma, and it's of my interest because I was involved in its discovery. But it's uh, not just that IL-1 activates uh, T cells in both Th2 and Th17, T cells in vivo and in vitro for humans and in mice. You can see the papers here. Next slide. We were the first uh, to identify IL-1 being present in airways in asthma uh, when I was working at National Jewish. There are uh, 13 family members, excuse me, I guess it's 11 family members uh, in the IL-1 genetic family. Uh, most of them are on chromosome 2Q13 except for IL-33, which is IL-1 F11, the, uh, I guess the 11th gene in that uh, family. IL-33 is on chromosome 9. A number of these agents are agonists for pro-inflammation or receptor antagonists, which makes them anti-inflammatory. So these pods of IL-1 genes and the proteins that they make involve agonists and receptor antagonists that sort of um, titrate in a servo mechanism, if you will, um, innate in immune responses that have impacts on allergy, as I'll show you. Next slide. Um, and this shows that um, almost all of these proteins are, uh, are uh, produced as precursors that have to have um, uh, uh, protease uh, cleavage for the actual material to be secreted. And that's true for IL-1 alpha and beta and IL-33, which we'll talk about in a minute. IL-18 is a pro-allergic response in this uh, category. Um, and uh, IL-37, which is anti-inflammatory, uh, are in the IL-18 subfamily. And then there's the IL-36 family, in which there's a receptor antagonist and an alpha, beta, and gamma IL-36, and an IL-38, which is anti-inflammatory in that process. So there's a lot of different um, potential biological and molecular biological handling of this family. IL-1 alpha and beta are very impotent very potent pro-inflammatory agents. IL-33 is particularly important because it's an epithelial cytokine. Next slide. That activates uh, the um, uh, immune response that's type 2 immune responses. Uh, IL-1 uh, can be blocked by a variety of agents that are available because they were approved for treatment of CAP syndromes, pediatric syndromes that are not very common, but IL-1 makes a major difference. Adult onset stills, which is an adult inflammatory disease, also responds very, very nicely to IL-1 inhibition with uh, rolonicept, canakinumab, or, or anakinra, which is also known as kineret, which has been utilized in pediatric uh, 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 rheumatology for a long time for pediatric arthritis. Next slide. IL-33 binds a protein called ST2, which is the IL-1 receptor 1 L1, and soluble ST2 and ST2 mark Th2 type cells, and IL-33 will activate these Th2 type cells and ILC type 2 cells through the um, accessory, IL-1 receptor accessory protein interacting with the ST2, IL-1, RL-1 uh, receptor. But the issue of IL-33 is, as you had heard, it's an important and potent 
stimulator of type 2 immunity and probably very important in asthma, atopic dermatitis, um, food allergy, pathogenesis. Next slide. <clears throat> IL-33 and ST2 have uh, come up in GWAS as being genetically linked to human asthma and a variety of GWAS studies list listed here, now going back eight or nine years ago. Next slide. Proteolytic processing of IL-33 is very similar to IL-1, alpha, and beta. Caspase type 1 is important as a protease site. The Japanese have also shown that cathepsin, elastase, and proteinase 3 are other cellular proteases that all get different amino termini to the shorter IL-1 active fold for IL-33. And they can show differences in specific activity depending on the amino terminus. The Japanese are very, very careful workers. But um, the issue is that all of those IL-33s, no matter how they're processed, are inhibited by the uh, anti-IL-33 REGN 3500 that's used clinically. So their work is very important. But IL-33, like IL-1, activates a variety of uh, cells. Um, type 2 ILC progenitors for different uh, other cytokine producing cells, mast cells, basophils, eosinophils, Th2 cells, NK cells all react to IL-33 and therefore it's an important pro-inflammatory agent. Next slide. And may be important in generating that pathogenesis of asthma and other allergic responses that we've measured and, and, and mentioned. IL-33 is just finished phase two studies and is in the early stages of phase three, as is tesapelumab, the anti-TSLP. Next slide. I just want to re remind you that uh, TH17 cells have been a hot item for a number of years to try and explain the most severe asthmatics that might be neutrophilic. Um, all of the big uh, studies try and actually uh, subset those individuals who have neutrophilic asthma have not really been uh, pathogenically pure in terms of predict predicting their activity. And uh, next slide, uh, the IL-17 family is made up of six genes. IL-17A and F are the big profibrotic uh, neutrophil stimulators uh, within the IL-17 family. IL-17E is IL-25, and that will activate a lot of the cells, both ILC2 and TH2 type cells. And genetics of the IL-17 family is linked to asthma, predominantly through the IL-25, IL-17E markers. But uh, there have been studies utilizing the anti um, IL-17 and IL-17 receptor monoclonal antibodies listed here, and also tocilizumab, which is actually an anti-IL-6, not an anti-IL-6 receptor that's been utilized uh, in asthma studies. Um, the earliest studies show equivocal responses, and that for, the, for that reason, next slide, many of the, um, uh, many of the uh, pharmaceutical companies have sort of dropped anti-IL-17 in severe asthma because the first studies were un, uh, unrewarding. So IL-17 may be an epiphenomenon associated with disease but not really causing much pathogenesis or at the wrong stratification and appropriate endpoints for the patients who might respond to an anti-IL-17 I think is the more likely uh, circumstance. The whole reason I think the pharmaceutical companies didn't want to progress with anti-IL-17 relates to uh, the anti-IL-17 agents have all been approved for psoriasis and they're a very lucrative, um, a very lucrative uh, market as far as psoriasis goes. And if the asthma studies sort of didn't look good or caused a problem, it might influence the psoriasis uh, indication. So that's been some of the explanation for why the anti-IL-17 studies haven't progressed. But they may be picked up at some later point when there's a better biomarker for the IL-17 subgroup. Next slide. So the newer treatments we have, omalizumab was the first biologic. The three anti-IL-5 agents are there. Dupilumab is approved not only for asthma and atopic dermatitis, but now rhinosinusitis based on some recent approvals, based on a very, very impressive set of data with nasal and sinus polyposis. 
uh, anti-TSLP, tezapelumab, and anti-IL-33, REGN-3500, name pending. Both of those are probably going to be coming up. This comes from the latest iteration of GINA uh, guidelines 0.6b, which is if you have patients with severe asthma and they reach a particular point of view, the biologic options you have are anti-IgE, anti-IL-5, anti-IL-5 receptor, an anti-IL-4 receptor for IL-4 and IL-13 type 2 immunity blockade. It has here some of the factors that you can take into consideration uh, for selecting a biologic to make the next move. And then clearly, you know, you look to a response within 6 to 12 months, perhaps 4 months, and then you continue that as long as you can, as long as the patient's under proper control. And eventually, you try to wean them off these biologics and see if their asthma has altered to the point where they're no longer in the severe category. Um, let me just say that um, my sense of how this is working is that people still pick the omalizumab because they're used to it. They know how to get it approved. They know how to give it to the patients in the beginning. And it's much like the rheumatoid arthritis and the anti-TNF area. Besides anti-TNF, there are about four or five other biologics that have now been approved for um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis treatment. But the rheumatologists still use Umira and TNF blockers as a first step because they're used to it and they're used to having the payers accept it. So I think omalizumab still will have an advantage for that reason alone, although I think in strongly eosinophilic asthma or EGPA, the anti-IL-5s are the first choice. And probably most of the asthmatics, since there's no biomarker that specifically is associated with IL-4, IL-13 blockade, although the higher the eosinophil is, the higher FENO, the better it does, um, as you would expect in uh, maybe these type 2 immune responses, the next step. So I think that's more or less, let's keep going. I have a couple of, just a summary to figure out exactly how we, um, how we work and how do we get to the next step in terms of biomarkers and pathogenesis beyond the cytokine? Some of it is related to the signaling molecules, JAK-STAT, Mighty 88, IRAC, etc., that might provide more small molecules that'll work. But once we learn more about pathogenesis through mathematical theory, high throughput, big data analysis, I think um, we may get a better idea of which roads to follow beyond the biologics I've already summarized for you from that GINA summary. Next slide. Yeah, uh, that's what I think for the future. I've been talking about this now for about 18 years, since I was president of the Quad AI. Next slide. In 2004, I had a view of what was going to happen in allergy 2030. I still think that that's true. Biotherapeutics is the key. We know that the cytokines play a major role based on the outcomes we're seeing with the anti-cytokines. We'll start to, pro, to, to hone that, start pharmacogenetic profiling. And why get seen in rheumatology? Uh, these agents, even though they cost so much, I think they'll move to a particular level where you start to consider the biologic agents as a first step, especially in younger individuals, because most of the uh, toxicities associated with these biologics is minimal compared to some of the small molecules and the inhaled steroids that we've been using for decades now. So I think we'll start to see early intervention, perhaps defined by biomarkers and pharmacogenetic profiling. Next slide. I don't think I have any more. Yeah, uh, I'm a big fan of the WOW Journal. It's no longer Biomed Central. It's L now Elsevier. But it's all open, out, open access, and it's all electronic. So uh, it's got some real good aspects. It burst on the scene with uh, probably the fourth best um, uh, risk, uh, um, you know, impact factor of all the allergy journals. It's fallen back to about seventh, which is what you expect after approval with a high level because it's gotten many, many more um, papers for submission. Uh, but if you're thinking of doing anything out in the world of COLA and you're looking for a journal to publish your results. It's a very good place. Anyhow, that's it. I'll be glad to answer questions. And I, uh, no questions then? Oh, that's great. Do you guys have many patients on 
anti-IL-5 agents? Mm, not too much. We mostly have most of our adults for the chronic uticaria. Um, yeah. We do have the severe asthma clinic, and I think they use more of it, but personally we haven't. We've done uh -huh. some pilimab for a lot of the patients that also have eczema on top of things. Yeah, no, it, it's um, it's unbelievable. Uh, you know, omalizumab works okay in about maybe a quarter of the asthma patients with severe asthma, and that's sort of what we had for the whole time. And then about a half of them may or may not do well, and then there's about a quarter that don't respond at all. But um, when we had no alternative to omalizumab, there wasn't really much choice. Now I think you'll be able to find some things that work. Um, you know, I don't mean to be conflicted, but I've worked with all of these. I know all of them. I know how all of them work. I've seen them all developed. And um, dupilumab is pretty striking. Uh, none of the ones I've seen have had uh, so such a good success right off the bat. There are a lot of people who think that maybe the tezapelumab and the anti-IL-33 are going to be better than uh, dupilumab, and I'm not so sure of that. One thing that I've learned in this kind of stuff is that uh, doing studies with these bio biotherapeutics, uh, what you would predict very often is not how that really turns out. Usually something else happens in the, in the way it turns out. And so um, we'll see what happens with uh, the anti-TSLP and anti-IL-33 and where it fits into treatment. But, you know, it's that's a couple years off. Anyhow. Thank you, Lanny. I appreciate it. Sure, Paul. Take care. No problem. Bye-bye. Thank you.